Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. God bless you, everybody. God bless you this morning. You know, this morning I'm, I'm not I'm not preaching. I'm not. Um, I just was, you know, uh, meditating in my heart as to what the Lord wanted. And I felt that we need to talk about the personality of Jesus himself. You know, it's one thing for me to see you. It's another thing for me to know your character, to know the nature of the person that you are. It's interesting, you know, when Benisola wrote there that uh, she asked the Lord uh, to, she asked the Lord to show us his heart this morning. Praise the Lord. She says she asked the Lord to surprise us and God is so wonderful. So I just want to talk about the personality of Jesus. And I put down that he must increase, but I must decrease. And there's a, a, a lot of the world that we're in today, there's a lot of increase in the things of the flesh, a lot of increase in self, a lot of increase in selfies and self and us and me and I. But we must decrease that he might increase. Praise the Lord. He must increase in us in Jesus name. So what was this Jesus like? as a person? That is the question that comes to mind. What was he like as a person? Isaiah 53, 2. I'm just going to talk. I don't know how he's going to lead me. He will have his way this morning. The Bible says, for he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. The Bible says when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. And when you look at the physical Jesus, maybe by the standards of the world in terms of flesh and physical things, we'll say, oh, he wasn't beautiful. It's not the blonde, blue-eyed that you're seeing out there. That is not the Jesus yeah, that was here physically. Uh, that is just the artist painting his painting. It was his personality that drew men to him. It wasn't his beauty. And it's our personality that must draw men unto Jesus, not our beauty. There are many beautiful people in the world, but their personality is not corresponding with that beauty. In fact, a lot of people are ugly by the time you find out about their character. That beauty fades. It, 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 doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't show at all because the person that you're seeing, you're saying, wow, what kind of character is this woman? When I first saw her, she's so beautiful, but look at her, she's so ugly, her character is so bad. So it's our personality that must draw men to Jesus in us. So Jesus was a man of great character. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And the Bible says he's despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He's acquainted with our grief. What are you going through that Jesus is not, doesn't know about? He's acquainted with it. We're not talking about the fact that he knows about it, but we're talking about the fact that he's been through it. It's two different things. When somebody's been through something, their story is totally different. It has a massive impact than somebody who's just telling a story. I can tell the story of Jesus, but I haven't walked his walk. I haven't carried the cross that he bore on, the, on, on Calvary. I haven't been through that walk. I'm just going through the fellowship of his sufferings. So what is this Jesus like? And I want to ask us, what is our personality like? What, else, what sort of a person are we? Because we can see the surface of Christianity, Christian. We speak the language, Christianites. We speak in tongues and all of that. 
But what's our personality like? Who are we really? And so when we look at Jesus, how much of yourself do you see in him? What manner of man is Jesus? He was a man of great character. Great character. And that's who we want to become. People of great character. When people see us, they will see Christ in us, the hope of glory. They will see his great character in us. Wherever we go. So he had a good personality. This is what this man Jesus is like. Every time I reflect on him, I'm just in awe of the person. Number two, he had a compassionate nature. He was compassionate. Are we compassionate? Do we think about other people before ourselves? Or are we selfish? Are we always thinking about ourselves? Oh, they didn't do this. Oh, they didn't do that. Oh, you know, are we moaning about what people haven't done? But what are we doing? Jesus was a compassionate man. He was compassionate in nature. He healed diseases. If, you, if you're not compassionate, you won't heal anybody's disease. You just leave them to rot away. But he healed the diseases. The Bible says that everywhere he went, he was doing good. This is a compassionate man. He fed the hungry. When we're compassionate, we feed the hungry. That is the character of Jesus in us. We feed the hungry. We have compassion on the poor. As Jesus did. He had compassion on the crowds. The Bible says that the crowd were like sheep without a shepherd. We all have gone astray and Jesus brought us back. Our good shepherd, he is our good shepherd. You know, when God brings people to me, it's my responsibility to pray for them. Whether you know it or not, you're being prayed for. My prayer is that no harm will come to you or your dwelling or your family. My prayer is that we will all grow together in the, in the love of God, our Father, and our Savior and our Lord Jesus Christ, that we will grow like a cedar in Lebanon, that we will flourish like a palm tree. And I thank God for the Holy Spirit because there's no way that you can manage so many people and their emotions without the help of the Holy Spirit. And so that compassion of Jesus, the Holy Spirit sheds the love of God abroad in our hearts. So when God brings people to you, to shepherd, to look after, to take care of, you will find that the Holy Spirit will begin to bring each one, different ones of them into your heart. He will say, Laddie, I want you to pray for this person today. Today, I want you to call that person. And you'll find that when you call the person, they needed it at that very point in time. He comes to meet his people at their point of need. He is compassionate. He is loving. He is kind. Are we compassionate? Are we loving like Jesus? Are we kind? Are we looking out for the needs of others? Are we ready to feed the hungry? The Lord spoke to me the other day, just two days ago. And he said to me, I want you to donate some money in Nigerian Naira, that is the currency of Nigeria, Nigerian Naira, and call this person and tell them, take this money and go and feed the poor. And I said, yes, Lord. You see, Jesus is thinking about the poor, about the hungry. We may not be thinking at that point in time, but when we're in sync with the Holy Spirit, his desires will become our desire. 
His compassionate heart will transfer and translate into our hearts where we become compassionate. We look out for the needs of others. And so the lady said to me, that is really wonderful because today, this Sunday today, we're going to announce in the middle of the church that a donation came from the United Kingdom to look after the welfare of the people. I wish I had enough time to put together all the different things by the grace of God, we'll be able to do it at some point that we do. We're not blowing our trumpet. We say to the glory of almighty God, because this is Jesus is doing. He's the one that is doing it. It's not me. It's not anybody. So I want you to know that your hands and your feet are in Africa this morning. Your labor is in Africa this morning. You might think it's a, it's a small amount. Oh, I only give 10 pounds. Oh, I only give uh, this. Up. Don't worry about what you gave is what Jesus is using right now. That's what he's using right now. To make sure that there's food on somebody's table. To make sure that somebody has clothes to wear. To make sure that whoever is crying this morning, Lord, Give us our daily bread. There's bread on their table. They will see Jesus on their table. They will see Jesus on their feet. They will see Jesus in the clothes that they wear. When that lady was going, we, I put so many things together to take. And she said, this is wonderful because when we get to the church, I just put the bags in the middle of the church and everybody comes to take something. So it's like a jumbo free sale. They're not selling anything, but it's like a jumbo. You just come and pick what you like. God meets us at the point of our need. This is Jesus. This is the heart of Jesus. We must never preach a message without the heart of Jesus. Otherwise, we're just faking it. A pastor that does not feed the poor does not know Jesus. A pastor that is collecting offering for his own benefits alone does not know Jesus. Because Jesus died for you and for me. He has compassion. He feeds the hungry. He looks after the harassed and the helpless. Praise the Lord. Another character of Jesus was that he was serious and he was focused. I want us to be serious with whatever God has called us to do. Be serious and be focused. It's not every day that I have ministry, like I have ministry on Saturdays, on Mondays, on Sundays, and whatever day. It's not every time I will wake up like strong, you want to be jumping up and down. But when the spirit of Jesus comes, he provides supernatural energy. You're thinking, where did this energy come from? It's coming from the spirit of Jesus. Why? Because Jesus wants us to be serious and focused. You can't say today, I'm too tired, I'm not going to do ministry, no. You can't say today, I'm not, you can go on holiday. God will give us a break. It's not a slave driver. But when you are called, you must be serious and focused. Because if Jesus was not focused, we won't be here today. He had a mission in life. You have a mission in life. He had a mission in life and he was never sidetracked from it. He did not sidetrack. We must never sidetrack. Oh, I'm, I'm too tired now. I've been doing it for five months. I'm tired. Well, you know, I'll leave it on the table for now. You know, you must know the weight of your calling. You must know the weight of your business. We have to, there's sacrifice. Because time is short. Jesus knew that his time was short. I don't want to scare you this morning, 
but I want to bring things into perspective. If you're 40 years old now, in another 30 years, you'll be 70. Time is short. If you're 50, in another 20 years, you'll be 70. If you're 60 years old now, in another 10 years, you'll be 70. And if you're 70, the Lord continues to bless us with many years and satisfies you with years. But what am I trying to say? Time is short. You must understand the weightiness of your calling and remember that you must be serious and focused. Because in those 10 years, in those 20 years, in those 30 years, However many years Christ has given us, we have a lot of work to do. We have souls to save. We have people to deliver. We have to make impact. We have to make impact. We have to leave a legacy. We can't afford to be partying every Sunday, every Saturday. Every, what clothes am I wearing? What shoes am I wearing? Well, those things are good. Don't get me wrong. If you work hard, there's no harm in playing. If you went to the shops and you wanted to treat yourself with, a, with a, a, a bracelet, it's a good thing. God is not saying don't look after yourself or don't enjoy yourself, but he's saying don't sidetrack. Be serious and know the weight of your calling. Significant mothers and fathers is one year old. In that one year, a lot has been done and a lot is still yet to be done. So Bumsi can't afford to just sit down and just be wondering, ah, I've done one year, so that's great. No, there's still work to be done. There's still a lot to do. There's souls to impact. There's food to be on the table. There's prayers to be done. There's fasting to be done. There's souls to reach out to. This morning, I've been thinking about some people. I don't want to mention your name this morning, but you came to my mind. And I know when God brings you to the surface like that, he wants me to, to touch them. I don't want to be that pastor that is far off. You know, Jesus is in heaven, but he's on earth. He reaches out to us. And I want to tell you today, whatever you do is not in vain. Whatever you do for Christ, that's the only thing that will last. When you get to the gates of heaven, the souls that you prayed for, the souls that you got saved, the souls that you made an impact in their lives will be thanking you for eternity. But you won't have your suitcase with you. You're not going to have your shoes with you. You have a mission in life. And like Jesus, may we never get sidetracked from it. May we recognize the shortness of time. And, and in that calling, Jesus had the attitude of a servant. Listen, this is where leaders get it wrong. I'm tired of proud leaders, arrogant leaders, leaders that don't have any touch at all with humanity. That is not a leader. Jesus was a servant leader. He had great character. We must be servants as leaders. The Bible says he did not come to be served, but he came to serve. We have come to serve, not to be served. When people love on me, I'm grateful. I'm forever thankful. I'm always saying thank you, Jesus. Father, I just thank you for even looking out for me. I'm so grateful because I'm not even expecting that. I just want them to feel loved. I want them to know that Jesus loves them. I want you to know that whatever you're going through, we're in it together. We are in it together. How can you be going through and I just don't care? And I just be going about my daily business like, oh, well, it's none of my business. Let her carry her own cross or let him carry his own cross. John's problem is my problem. If John is not happy, I'm not happy. If you're not happy, I'm not happy. And the reason why I will not be happy is because I'm going to take your case to the courts of Jesus, to the courts of heaven. I'm going to take your case and say, Father, my sister, my brother is not happy. 
And therefore, I'm not happy. Lord, do something. And I began to pray and I begin to just pray for you. I have a sister in Nigeria. I'm praying for her. She's not my blood sister, but she has become my blood sister by the blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus was kind. And he was selfless. That is his personality. Are we selfless? We must check ourselves because we want to be more like him. Self selflessness means I'm not looking out for myself first. I am not selfish. I am selfless, less of myself and more of others. And that is his personality. We want to be more like him. You see, as I begin to think about Jesus, I realize that, wow, what a great personality. What kind of person is this Jesus? This Jesus was submissive to the Father's will. He was submissive. Submission means whether you feel like it or not, you're going to do the work that God has called you. You're going to do the will of the Father. Whether you feel like it's not by feelings. Oh, I don't feel like doing it. No, that's not. Mm -mm. It doesn't work like that in the kingdom. It works by submission of our will. That, Lord, I may not feel like it. Please take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will. I submit my will to you. Jesus was submissive. We must be submissive to the will of the Father. We must be. And that's why he went to the cross. You can imagine when he was betrayed. That night was really a bad night for him. And I suppose somebody like me would just be moaning to God, today is a bad day. God. Today, I've been through too much from morning and now it's midnight and I'm still going through. God, somebody's betraying me right now. God, take this cup away from me, please. This laddie can't carry this cross. And the Lord is saying, God himself will be saying, I have a mission to save humanity. If you don't go, they're all going to perish. They're all going to die. None of them will be left. And Jesus is looking at the cup and he's saying, let what you want be done. We must abandon ourselves to God. We must abandon, he abandoned himself. And he said, my father, let what you want be done. We must say that to Jesus. Let what you want be done. Let what you want be done. Not what I want. There are many things that we want. We want peace. We don't want any more trials. Sometimes I sit down and I think, oh my goodness. Where is the next one coming from? Lord Jesus, I plead the blood of Jesus against any attacks of the enemy. Because <laughs> you get tired. You're thinking I overcame. But the Bible says, nay, in all of these things, all of these things, you are more than a conqueror. Many things come our way. And it's like, oh, Father, please, I need a break. But then what we need to do in that moment is abandon ourselves. We must abandon ourselves to Jesus and say, not what I want, 
but what you want. Because there's a purpose in the trial that you're going through. There's a reason why. And so we must be submissive to the Father. No matter what, we must lay down our lives in submission to the desires of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's not by word only. You know, you can preach and, you know, speak in tongues for two hours and all of that. But submission is key. And that submission must come from the heart. It must come from the heart. What if God said to a pastor whose congregation are 800, 1,000, 2,000 people, and the Lord says, I want you to just leave the church, raise somebody else, anoint them, and hand over the church to them. And they will take over the church. And I want you to go and start from scratch. Or I want you to stay away from preaching for a year and just come and seek me. That is a huge thing. Because God might just be looking at the heart of that person to know whether they're actually in submission to his will or they're there for themselves. Jesus was facing an enormous task of carrying the cross, the sins, the weight of this world on his shoulders. He didn't even commit any sin. He grew up in a sinful family, but he did not commit any sin. So he doesn't have to carry that cross. He didn't have to. He really didn't have to die. But he did. Because of you and because of me. And that's why we want to be more like him. He gave his life for us. What else is this Jesus like? He has a heart of mercy and forgiveness. That's why we struggle. He has a heart of mercy and forgiveness. Luke 23, 34. The heart of Jesus is just amazing. Twenty-three verse thirty-four says, "And he said, I tell you, Peter. No, this is not the one. I'm looking at twenty-two. It's Luke twenty-three. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them." For they do not know what they do. There were two criminals next to him on the cross there. They were crucified where they were crucifying Jesus at Calvary. There were two criminals there, one on the right hand and the other on the left. And he was still asking for God to forgive. He was still asking for God to forgive them. The Bible says that if we admit that we have sinned, he will forgive us our sins. We don't deserve that forgiveness. Jesus has a heart of mercy and forgiveness. We must have a heart of mercy like Jesus and be forgiving. This is crucial. And so we must ask the Lord to to check our hearts, to search our hearts, to help our hearts. Because every day we have an opportunity not to forgive people, and that will hold us back. It's not them, it's us that it will hold back. And so we must forgive the sinner, forgive the thief, forgive everybody. Let's go to 1 John chapter 1. First John 1 verse 9. 
It says, if we confess, okay, let me go to, uh, in fact, let me just go back to verse five. First John chapter one, verse five says, this is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. That God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and we don't practice the truth. Because we can't be walking in darkness and saying that we have fellowship with Christ. Yet we don't practice the truth. We must practice the truth of the word of God. Verse 7, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, it's conditional. It's up to you to confess. If you do it, if we confess our sins, he is faithful. You see, he is faithful in mercy. He is faithful in forgiveness. He is faithful in loving kindness. He will come and he will forgive us our sins. And he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness because where there is sin, there's unrighteousness. So it's not only that he will forgive us, it's not only that he will have mercy on us, but he will clean us. He will wash us white as snow. Praise the Lord. So if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar. And his word is not in us. If you hear somebody say, oh, I haven't sinned, they're a liar. They are a liar. And the word of God is not in them. They're fakers. Praise the Lord. This our God is too good. And that's why I love Jesus so much. He is so different to us. He's so amazing. He's so wonderful to meditate on and just take the time to focus on and observe and learn about his character and just want to be like him. I remember I always say this when I was in the choir. And there's this lovely lady, very gentle. In fact, but Faith, you remind me of that lady. She was just so sweet, very gentle. And I would look at her and I'd go to her and say, I want to be like you. And she would just laugh. <laughs> she said, Lade, you don't want to be like me. I want to be like you. I want to be strong and bold and like that, like how you are. I said, no, I want to be like you. You're so sweet, honestly. You're just so beautiful. Your soul, I can see from out, your soul is beautiful. You know? And that's how Jesus is. He's a beautiful spirit. We want to be like him. When you meditate on him, you just want to be like him. You just want to be more and more like him. He is just so amazingly wonderful. Can you imagine? He's been with you in that house for what? How long have you lived there? 10 years? 15 years? 20 years? 22 years? 5 years? He's been with you in that house. Never complaining once. He's never left. And anything you want in the house, he will do. Because you are his own. So if you say, Lord, I'm tired of this ceiling. Honestly, I just want to do something different. Will you inspire me? Lord, I want this place to reflect you. You know, I want it to be beautiful. I want to walk in here and just feel your presence. And Jesus will just be dancing. And you really do want to feel that? Okay, let's do it. And he will begin to inspire you by the anointing of the Holy Spirit. He will begin to speak to you. And before you know it, you've transformed. That place is transformed. You look at it and say, without Jesus, I couldn't have done this. He's interested in every single aspect of your life. Every aspect of your life. He's interested in. Praise God. And so, another one of his character his beautiful personality is that he's loving in his relationships. He is loving in his relationships. 
He's interested in that jollof rice you want to cook in the kitchen. He's interested in your choice of restaurant you want to go and eat. Mom is smiling because she knows. Praise the Lord. He's interested in what you are interested in. When I'm painting, he's interested. And I'm saying, Lord, inspire this painting. I want your spirit to be reflecting through this painting. And I want you to know that objects are points of contact in the spiritual realm. So you could buy an object that is dedicated to a demon and that demon will be invoked inside your home if you bring that object in. It's in the same manner that Jesus is interested in his spirit upon everything that you do. So when I'm painting, I want to paint a painting that the anointing of the Holy Spirit will rest on so that when whoever buys that painting or is hanging that painting in their home, the spirit of Jesus is on the wall right there. The Holy Spirit is breathing upon their home. Praise the living Jesus. I don't joke with my Bible. To me, it's just so sacred. Some people will say it's just paper. To me, it's more than paper because it is the word of God. So I treat it like an egg. I don't fling my Bible anywhere. It comes downstairs with me. It goes upstairs with me. It stays right beside me in my bedroom. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. The word is my companion. We must make the word our companion. So Jesus is loving in his relationships. Guess who's got, who he's got that relationship with? You and I. We have a personal relationship with him. And that's why the crowd is good. Corporate anointing is good, you know. We go to church, we all clap together, we all pray together. You know, when I went to the uh, uh, um, Nathaniel Bassett concert, it was awesome. The place was filled with people. The anointing was there, which is wonderful. But the best relationship is that one-to-one -one relationship, one-on-one. -on -one. That relationship you have with Jesus in your kitchen, in your bedroom, in your living room, in your garden. That Jesus that you're talking to that went to New York with you. He got on the aeroplane with you. He's talking to you on the plane. And then you landed, he's landed with you. You get in the hotel and you say, Lord, you know, choose the best hotel room for me. And you get in the room and you say, Jesus, look at this room. It reflects you. And then you say, let your spirit be in this room. I anoint this room in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And the spirit of Jesus is in your hotel room. Wherever you go, Jesus is there. Christ in you is a hope of glory. He's loving in his relationships. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. You know, John was known as the disciple whom Jesus loved. Oh, oh, wow. The one whom Jesus loved. You are that one now. You are the one whom he loves. You are the disciple whom Jesus loves. He loves you. Otherwise, he wouldn't have died. John, you're that one that he loves. Praise the Lord. Yes. It's you. You are that one that Jesus loves. You're looking for another John. You know, the Bible, John was known. Let's go to John 13, 23. John 13, 23. John is surprised. Now, there was leaning on Jesus, on Jesus's bosom, one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. He was leaning on Jesus's bosom. Wow. You are the one whom Jesus loves today. You are the person, that person listening to my voice today. You are the one whom Jesus loves. When I said to John now, you are the one whom Jesus loves, he's looking behind him. Some of us are still looking behind us. Is it the other person? No, it's you. You are his beloved. You are the one he's got a relationship with. Praise the Lord. Jesus 
has a reputation for being good, for being caring. He cares. He's good. And I know all of us care about one another. We do. Now, I'm not fussy at all. If somebody doesn't call me, I'm not going to, oh, they haven't called me. Oh, he didn't call me this week. Oh, he didn't do it. No. Because I know that they care about me. I know that they love me. Because everybody is busy. Everybody is doing something. I give room for that. We praise God for giving us one another. You are Jesus' beloved. Praise the Lord. And it, because you're Jesus' beloved, you are our beloved. I've got nicknames for different people. Some of you don't know your nickname, but I've got in my heart. One of them is my teddy bear, and I'm not going to tell who that is. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So I'm looking at different people. It's wonderful for us to be amongst one another, to love one another, to care about one another. If they ask me, ask me who my favorite dog is now. You know, I used to have a dog when I was younger. His name was Fluffy. Fluffy was beautiful, a beautiful soul. But guess what? I have a new dog now. His name is Max. Max listens to my voice. When I went to Max's house, I'm looking at Max. He's gorgeous. Gentle. Praise the Lord. The Bible says, let everything that has breath, praise the Lord. Does Max have breath? Max can praise the Lord. A donkey can praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Max is gorgeous. You are gorgeous. You are beautiful. And Jesus loves you. If you were the only one that was left, he would still have cared enough to die for you because he's good and he's very caring. That's his personality. If I find that out, if I ever find out that one of you, you're suffering with something or something or you're struggling with something, trust me, you will hear from me. Unless I don't know. You will hear from me. Because you are precious. If somebody calls me and they're crying, my heart is like, Jesus, we've got to do something now. If you say, I will trouble Jesus. He has to deliver. The Lord Jesus, your daughter, your son, look what they're going through. We've got to do something. And honestly, Jesus moves. He moves. He brings a change. Yesterday, we witnessed the power of Jesus. And I can't go into details. Just through the power of prayer alone. Christ turned the situation around just like that. Just like that. And I'm like, whoa, Jesus, you are awesome. Look at how you just changed that. All God needs is you and I. That's all he needed. For us to be present. And he's already there. Praise the Lord. There's nothing he cannot do. He always shows concern for those afflicted. Anybody that is afflicted, Jesus shows concern for them. That's why, in a way, small groups are better than a massive, big thousand, five thousand place. Because in that five thousand, you get lost. I'm not saying a big church is not good, very good. But in the small groups, Jesus had a few disciples. He would go here and go there, and he was impacting. Miracles were happening, signs, wonders were following. Of course, crowds would follow him as well. But he would depart from one place and go to the other. He didn't build a tower of Babel anywhere. He was constantly on the move. Ministering. Healing. Delivering. Loving. He was healing everywhere he went. He was just delivering people. And that's how people knew that this is the Christ. See, that's how they will know you're the daughter, the son of God. They will know. 
when you see somebody with a problem, you say, you're, you're, you've got this farmland and there's no harvest. You've been having, what did you say? You're having locusts or something. Let's pray. You will go there in the name of Jesus because you know that you've got Jesus the deliverer. You've got Jesus the healer. You've got Jesus. And you go in the name of Jesus. Let me pray over your land. And you pray. And from that moment, things began to grow on that land. Nowhere will remain barren where we are. In the name of Jesus. There will be no barrenness in your land. There will be no barrenness in your home. There will be no barrenness with whatever you do in your business. There will be no barrenness in your job. In the name of Jesus Christ. No barrenness because Jesus is fruitful. Praise the Lord. And so I will go to the next one that Jesus was truthful. He's an honest, truthful personality. The Bible says, my words will never come back to me void, but will accomplish that to which I have sent it. So God is a God of integrity, a God of truth, a God of honesty. If he said it, he will do it. We are the ones who doubt the words, not God. God spoke it and he will bring it to pass. Now we need to hold on to it and believe and trust him. Because God is true. Jesus is truthful. He is honest. He is peaceful. The Bible says in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus said to him, I am the way. I am the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Nobody on the face of this earth can get through to Jehovah without Jesus. Nobody. Because he is the way. He is the truth and he is the life. And well, he's not a bully. We are bullies. He's not a bully. Let me tell you the reason why I say we are bullies. We like to force our opinion on other people. We like to make people feel bad. This is the world we live in. You know, we like to make people think, oh, you know, if it was me, I would have done this. But who are you really? If it was me, I'm better than you, in other words, because I, 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 I'm, I'm a better person. But Jesus is not like that. He's not proud. He doesn't bully his personality into other people's lives. He acknowledges their weakness and he helps them through it. We're supposed to be compassionate and helpful. We're not supposed to be a headmaster, a headmistress, a bully. If it's me, blah, 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 blah. Jesus never does that. He's intimate with us. Are you a follower? Jesus is intimate with you. He will spend quality time with us and quantity time. It's us that don't have the time. We don't have time, but he's got the time for us. Quality time, quantity time. This is what we're spending with him right now. Quality time. He wants our fellowship. He wants to teach us. He wants to fellowship with you and with me. He's our friend. He wants to help us. At times when I feel like a fly, like I'm too small. Say, Jesus, I'm too small. Look at me, I'm boomsy. David and Goliath. My, 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 my hand is at Boomsy's waist when I'm hugging Boomsy. I'm, I'm hugging her because she's so tall. And when people see me, they think, ah, is that the Pastor Lady? And I just laugh. You see, the enemy could have used that, but because I know who I am in Christ, it doesn't affect me. See, because the enemy is twisted. It would twist things. So I just love God's sense of humor. That he chose this tiny little vessel and he decides to use this vessel. <laughs> so I laugh with him that God, you're so funny, honestly. You can't go and choose somebody who's like 
you know, go and choose somebody that is so tall and so big. So when they enter like a, a, a hall where they're going to speak, people will say, oh, okay, yes, this is Billy Graham. But when I enter, <laughs> it's so funny. Even now it's making me laugh, honestly. I entered one church. I walked into the church. And everybody is looking for the pastor that is coming to speak. They're still looking for the pastor. Well, I'm walking in. <laughs> God has a sense of humor. It's not until I start speaking that everybody goes quiet. It's like, oh, what? He's Christ. He's amazing. Honestly, he's amazing. He will use the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. That is what he said. So little old me stands on this huge stage and everybody's looking like, wow. In fact, my husband had disappeared in the congregation because he didn't even knock onto the front. He just found the chair and sat on it. So I'm looking for him like, oh, where's my husband? They say, oh, where's your husband? I say, it's in the middle. <laughs> my man brought him to the front. And eventually brought him to the stage to come and pray. <laughs> I felt sorry for him because I know he doesn't want those things. And I was laughing inside me, honestly. I was rolling inside my stomach. Between me and Jesus, we were laughing. Little young me. <laughs> praise the Lord. Oh, praise God. You know, this God is too good. Too good. If it were not for Jesus. Who are we? Who are we? We're nothing. The world would trod on our heads, make you feel like nothing. But Christ in us, the hope of glory. <laughs> Praise the Lord. You know, somebody met me two weeks ago and she said, I said, I know, because the pastor Lade you've seen is so small, isn't it? <laughs> she said, but uh, they told me you are you're small but mighty. <laughs> exactly what you just wrote there. She said, they told me, but you're, you're small but mighty. When Jesus is mighty, Jesus is the one that is mighty inside the small person. Praise the Lord. He's intimate with us. I love him. You call high dynamite, breast you, you ever see. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Isn't it, isn't it wonderful? He is, he is strong, but quiet. That's one thing about Jesus. Honestly, if you want to be more like him, he is strong, but quiet. Hallelujah. You know, I love our Abba Father. You know, look in the Old Testament. Abba Father was talking all along with the children of Israel constantly. Moses said, I can't speak. God said, I will help you. You know, Moses said, but I still stammer. I did. He said, but I will help you. Okay, never mind. I'll bring your cousin Aaron. I'll bring. He was interactive all the time. And then now that's why I said to God, when I first came to Christ, I said, when I started hearing the voice of Jesus, when God began to speak to my heart, I said, wow, speak a lot. I thought you were quiet because the God I knew in the world was a quiet, mute God. That's the person they introduced me to. We just sing hymns, hymn books. We, uh, Reverend, we will say what he needs to say and we all go home. So I didn't know this God that is so interactive, so loving, so kind, this Jesus, so wonderful, so precious. You spend your whole night, your whole day, you wake up and you're still talking to him and he's still talking to you. Praise God. He's patient. Everybody was eager. They were eager to hear him. But he's also authoritative. Don't get me wrong here. Jesus has authority. That's when, you know, with your softness, with your kindness, with your loving, be firm. Be firm. Don't let people trot on your head. He knew when he needed to drive people out of the church because they turned it into a marketplace. He took authority. Don't allow the devil to turn your home into a marketplace, to turn your Christianity into a marketplace, to turn your life into a carpet. No, take authority. Be authoritative, but strong, gentle, quiet. Don't tolerate no rubbish from those demons. So these are traits that we should desire. These are, these are, these are things that we should desire. 
Amen. And may he continue to conform us into his own image. May we not resist his will for our lives. Do you know you've changed? You've changed. I've changed. The person that I was when I started with Jesus is not the person I am now. The person that I was last week is not the person I am today. We continue to change, to transform, to be, to be conformed to his will. Amen. So you are a friend of Jesus. And that's why we say he must increase, but we must decrease. Amen. He must increase in us, but we must decrease. And other people will see who Christ is in us. We must be yielding to him for who he is. Praise the Lord. Amen. So I just wanted to just talk about Jesus, the person, the personality. And that's where I will end it. I want you to always reflect on him, you know, even in the midst of your problems, just sit down and think, Jesus, what would you do as you're sitting with me on this bench right now underneath this tree? What would you do if you were in my shoes? And he will really speak to you. He will speak to you. If you're feeling anxious, he will calm you down. His peace will just surround you. Don't worry about anything. You will not lose anything. We don't lose in Christ. We're winners already. We're victorious already. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Let me just speak to those online. If you don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, I invite you today. He's a very good personality to know. He's a very good personality to know. And so I pray for you in the name of Jesus. If you desire this morning to give your heart to this Jesus that is loving, caring, kind, wanting a personal, intimate relationship with you, this is the time to do it. Because tomorrow might be too late. So if you listen to the sound of my voice this morning and you desire to know Jesus as your Lord and personal Savior, I invite you to please pray after me and say, Lord Jesus, I come before you today and I give my heart to you. I want to be more like you. This person that they've described today, I want to be more like you. And so I repent of all my sins. I ask you to please forgive my iniquities. I yield my heart to you today. And I ask you to come, Jesus and be the Lord and savior of my life. I yield my will to you. I submit my will to you. And I ask for your kingdom to come and be established in my heart. From today onwards, I'm a friend of God. I'm a friend of Jesus. I'm a friend of Jesus. And I receive your peace. I want you to receive the peace of Jesus right now. That peace, yeah, that you haven't experienced before. You've tried so many ways, so many things to give you peace. You've tried yoga. You've tried exercise. You've tried all sorts of things and it's not working. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am your peace. So receive the peace of Jesus right now. And you will find that you're sleeping better from today. Your heart is at rest from today. I plead the blood of Jesus over your heart. Lord Jesus, I pray for that person listening to my voice right now. I plead the blood of Jesus over them. I bind worry. I bind anxiety. I bind fear right now. I bind insomnia. And I speak peace over them right now. Your peace that passes all understanding. I pray that we guard their heart and their minds in Christ. So Father, we give you praise. We worship you. We magnify your holy name. Thank you for receiving this wonderful person in your kingdom from today and forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. If that is you, our contact uh, details, uh, our email address is churchofnewdestiny at gmail.com. If you'd like to contact us, please do and feel free. From today, the peace of Christ will rest upon your heart. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you and thank you for listening.